All right, hello everyone. This is chapter 5.3, Conditional Probability and Independence. So our learning targets for this video are to calculate and interpret conditional probabilities, determine if two events are independent, use the general multiplication rule to calculate probabilities, use a tree diagram to model a chance process involving a sequence of outcomes, and to calculate probabilities, and when appropriate, use the multiplication rule for independent events to calculate probabilities. So to start, what is conditional probability? The probability we assign to an event can change if we know that some other event has occurred. This idea is the key to many applications of probability. So the probability that one event happens given that another event is known to have happened is called the conditional probability. The conditional probability that event B happens given A has happened is denoted by P as in probability parentheses B, that bar, the vertical bar, A, close parentheses. So really how this is read is the probability of B given A. So this line is, um, is read as given, okay? So again, the probability of B given A, right? So let's put into context and do a problem. In 1912, the luxury liner Titanic on its first voyage across the Atlantic struck an iceberg and sank. Some passengers got off the ship in lifeboats, but many died. Suppose we randomly select one of the adult passengers from the Titanic. Define the event F as a first, pass, first class passenger, S is someone who survived, and T is a third class passenger. It tells us to find, the way you read this is the probability of T, which is third class, given that they survived. So I'm, I'm finding the probability someone is a third class passenger, given I know the person survived, and interpret this value in context. So essentially I'm looking up all this data, I pick somebody, I know that they've survived, which probability that they are a third class passenger. So um, I'm going to look, I know that they survived, okay? So I am in this row. I know that they survived. I know they're one of 442 people, okay? The probability is what what probability of those 442 people are they? It's not just, I'm, I'm looking for them to be third class and survived. So the way you find that, like I said, you know you're pulling, there's only a total of 442 outcomes, right? Because you know that they survived. So there's 442. And from our general rule of probability, right, the probability even of any event happening is a probability or the number of outcomes for that event divided by the total number of outcomes. So the total number of outcomes, if they had to survive, is 442. And then the probability of the event, well, the event is third class given that they survived. There's only 151 third class survivors. So that's the number of people I can pick from. So this probability is equal to about 0.34. And then given that value in context, it's given that a randomly chosen person survived, there's about a 34.2% chance that they were a third class passenger. Okay. B, I'm going to go back a second. B, given that the person, the chosen person is not a first class passenger, what is the probability that she or he survived? So we know they are not first class. So first class is F. So we're looking at the other two, second or third. However, the way we denote it, if you're not first class, that's where you use the complement, right? And so we're going to look probably survived given not first class. That's a probability of survived or S given F complement, the complement of first class, it's everyone besides first class. So again, I'm, I know for a fact that they're not first class, so they're second or third. So the total number of people that could be selected here is 261 plus 670, 627, because they could be a second class or a third class, all right? And then I want to find the probability that they survived. So that'd be their survival would be, there's 94 second class survivors and 151 third class survivors. So I add those together to be my numerator. And that is where I get my probability. Mm -hmm. When they say using correct symbols for the event, this is the correct symbol. It's P parentheses S given FSC close parentheses. You're using all the variable names. They've already told you what each variable is. 
and now they use them instead of the names. So that's the probability statement with the correct symbols. Yeah. This is the definition and the formula for conditional probability. So probability of A given B uses the formula that it's probability of A and B divided by probability of B. Okay, again, the probability of B or A given B, you know B happened, so you're automatically dividing by the, uh, the probability of B because you know it's happened. So another way you could write this is probability of A intersect B. Remember, A intersect B is how you find probability of A and B. Okay, So they're closely related. And so that just means hey, it's the probability that both events occur divided by the probability that the given event occurred. In this context, the choice of A and B is arbitrary, or it doesn't matter. So you could just flip-flop them. right? The probability of B given A is equal to probability of B and A over probability of A. They're just letters at this point, so you could put anything in here. Um, but if the problem is arbitrary, like you, you haven't identified A and B, um, then you could put either one. Now, obviously, we would just set it up based on the question that we have or the setup that we have. So from the previous uh, video, but a survey of all residents in a large apartment complex reveals that 68% use Facebook, 28% use Instagram, and 25% do both. Suppose we select a resident at random. Given that the person uses Facebook, what's the probability that she or he uses Instagram? So we know that they use Facebook. So it has to be one of these 68%. And so that's our denominator. And we're going to divide by the probability of both, which is 25%. So probability of Instagram given Facebook would be probability of Instagram given, or probability of I given S. And that's the same as probability. So to use the formula to be probability of I intersect F divided by probability of F. So the intersect is the and or both events occurring. So it'd be 0.25 divided by probability of Facebook, which is 0.68. All right. Now we're going to talk about independent events. So A and B are independent events. If knowing whether or not one event has occurred does not change the probability that the other event will happen. So I want to rephrase that. Independent events, they're independent if knowing one does not change the other. So for example, if I'm talking about like my two events, A and B, I'm going to give, um, well, no, I'm not going to give an example, but just they're independent if knowing the problem, the outcome of one doesn't change the other. So if I can speak off of this using that uh, independent sequence, there are probabilities that the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A given B complement, so this is probability of A, knowing that B happened, should be the same prob probability as A, given that B did not happen. The fact that B occurs shouldn't change it. So if B occurred or B didn't occur, it doesn't change anything. And that should also mean that it should equal the probability of just A on its own. So that the probability of A given B, it should be equal to just probability of A. Knowing that B occurred does not change the probability of A. And then alternatively, it just flip flops it again. It's just changing the variable names in order, um, but you just set it up based on your exam. So in this problem below, we're going to see does um, are the events pierced ear and male independent? So if someone has pierced ears and male, are those events independent? So we're going to get probability of pierced ear given that they're male. So that would be probability of um, pierced given male. So we know that there's 90 total males. So that's my denominator divided by my probability that they are male and pierced ears, right? That's the intersection. That's 19. So 19 out of 20 would be 0.21. Okay. Then to check it, right, I'm going to do probability of pierced ear given not male, right? I'm going to take the complement, so not male, but in this case, not male is just female in this table. So probability of pierced ear given female is the same as probability of pierced ear given not, not male. Well, there is 88 females and 84 females with pierced ear, so we divide that out, that's 0.955. Right. So knowing that the, the, cho the chosen student is a male changes the probability that the student has a pierced ear. So these two events are not independent because the probability of pierced ear given male does not equal the probability of uh, pierced ear given not male. 
So it greatly changes those, so they are not independent. All right, so here's another one. Is there a relationship between gender and handedness? To find out, we use, we use censuses at schools, random data selector to choose an SRS of 100 on the in high school students who completed the survey. The two-week table summarizes the relationship between gender and time of hand for these students. Suppose we chose one of the students from the sample at random. Are the events male and left-handed independent justified? So we're, we're going to take probably that they're left-handed given that they're male. And so I know that they're male, so it's 46 total. And then the fact that they are left-handed and male would be seven. So seven out of 46 versus probability of left-handed given not male. Again, not male would be female in this case. So that would be there's 54 females and left-handed. There are three female left-handed, so three out of 54. Those probabilities are not equal. So the probability of uh, left-handed given male and the probability of left-handed given female are different. So knowing if they're male or female, if you know that they're male, there's a higher percent chance that they're left-handed than that they were female. So these are not independent events. This sub, we're going to the next subsection of the general multiplication rule. Here's an example to kind of prompt it. So about 55 high school students participate in the school's athletic team. So 55, if of the high school, 55% are on an athletic team. Roughly 6% of those athletes go on to play in college. So of the 55 student athletes, six of them go on to play in college. So what percentage of high school students play a sport in high school and go on to play on the NCAA team? Well, that's about 6% of 55%, which is roughly 3.3%. Now you said, hmm, how do we get that? Here is our probability. We're trying to find the probability that they were on a high school sport and then played in college on the NCAA team. So the general multiplication rule is highlighted here. It's the probability of A, if this is A and B, is the probability of A times the probability of B given A. Okay. The reason this flips is that it's the probability of A times, it can't just be probability of A times B. So the fact is, is that you already know A happened. Boom. Knowing A happened can alter B. So the fact that both of them happen at the same time, you know that A happened. So it's times by the probability of B, given that A has already happened. So the probability of a high school sport is 55 times 0.6. That's of those people in high school, you know that they're a high school player. 6% play on a high school team. So that's what you multiply to get. This is it symbolically. So for any chance process, the probability that the events A and B both occur can be found using the general multiplication rule. So probability of A and B is equal to probability of A intersect B, which is probability of A times probability of B given A. So I know A happens times probability of B given A has already happened because I know A's happened. So here's an example. The Pew Internet and American Life Project reported that 79% of teenagers aged 13 to 17 use social media and that 39% of teens who use social media feel pressure to post content that will be popular and get lots of comments or likes. Find the probability that a randomly selected teen uses social media and feels pressure to post content that will be popular and get them lots of comments or likes. So probability of using social media and, and feel pressure. So this is going to be like my A event and my B. So the probability of using social media times probability that they feel pressure given that they use social media. We know that they're already on social media. So probability of social media is 0.79 times probability that they feel pressure given that they are on social media is 0.39. Multiply those together to get our probability. The next subsection is tree diagrams with conditional probabilities. So a tree diagram shows the sample space of a chance process involving multiple stages. So one event happens, then the next event happens. That's what tree diagrams show. The probability of each outcome is shown on the corresponding branch of the tree. So the probability of the outcome is on the branch. That's important to remember. All probabilities after the first stage are technically conditional probabilities. 
So let's just take an example. So this is, um, we're trying to see if someone is on time or not, given, or if we know if they hit the snooze button. So if someone wakes up, they hit the snooze button 60% of the time, 40% of the time they don't hit the snooze button. So that's where we mean that the probabilities of each outcome is on the branch. Here's the branch. So it's 60% that you hit the snooze button, okay? And 40% that you don't hit the snooze button. If you know that they've hit the snooze button, there's a 70% chance that they stay on time. So it's the, the probability that they stay on time, given that they hit the snooze button, that's on this path, right? Because we're given, if we hit the snooze button, we've already traveled along this path. So we know snooze button occurred, and now it's a probability that they're on time, which is 0.7, which means if they hit the snooze button, they're late 30% of the time. If they don't hit the snooze button, right, we fall down this one, it's 90% time they are on time, and 10% of the time they are late. So that's why these, this first row, they're all conditional probabilities, and it's a probability of this event happening given the, the branch that they're on has already happened. So let's do an example. Recently, um, there's been reported that 20% of millennials, 25% of Gen Z, Gen Xers, 21% of baby boomers, and 17% of matures read more eBooks than print books. According to the Census Bureau, 34% of those are 18, 30% of those 18 and over are millennials, 22% are Gen Xers, 30% are baby boomers, and 14% are matures. So draw a tree diagram to suppose this. So first things first, there's two kinds of surveys going out there. We have a census bureau to break them down, and then each category they tell us who prefers or what percent prefer ebooks more than print books. So I'm gonna make my tree diagram. My first thing I'm gonna break up is by um by their age bracket or by their um their generation. So we have we have our sample size, right? Everyone's a randomly chosen adult. And then they break off, they're either a millennial, a Gen Xer, a baby boomer, or a mature. And the probabilities are each of those. So 34% are millennials, 22% are Gen Xers, 30% are baby boomers, and 14% are mature. Then of the millennials, right, we know 20% of millennials prefer ebooks than print books. So 20% prefer um, ebooks over print books. That means that 80% of them, millennials, prefer print books over ebooks. So again, this probability, this row, they're all conditional probabilities. This is conditional or on the condition that you, they are millennial. So the probability that they, that they read more ebooks, given that they're millennial, is 0.2. Okay. The probability that they are that they read more ebooks, given that they're a Gen Xer, is 0.25. The probability that they read more ebooks, given they're a baby boomer, is 0.21. And the probability that they read more ebooks, given that they're a mature, is 0.17. So now find the probability that the person reads more ebooks than print books. So the ebooks, right? They could be, they could write be more ebooks and be a millennial. They could be more ebooks and a Gen Xer, more ebooks and a baby boomer, or more ebooks and mature. They could be either one of these four categories. So we want to find the probability that they are that they are a millennial and read more ebooks. Well, the probability of both of those events occurring are just multiplying across the branches. When you multiply the, the branches of a tree diagram, that's the probability of both events occurring. So it's probability of millennial and more ebooks is 0.34 times 0.2. So if I want to add up all those, then it'd be the probability of that times probability of Gen Xer and more ebooks, which is 0.22 times 0.25. That they're a baby boomer and read more ebooks, I multiply them together to be 0.3 and 0.21. And then that they're mature and more ebooks, 0.14 times 0.17. You add all four of those together, that's the probability that you read more ebooks. Right. Now, suppose the chosen person reads more ebooks than print books. What's the probability that she or he is millennial? So we know that they read more ebooks than print books. What's the probability that they're millennial? So we just found out the probability that they read more ebooks is 0 0.2098. So that's going to be my denominator, right? I know that they read more ebooks. So it's 0.298. And now my probability is what's the probability that? They are millennial. So that would be millennial and reads more ebooks. That's that 0.34 times 0.2 that we just found. So millennial and reads more ebooks over probably more ebooks. The 0 0.2098 comes from that last problem. And also the millennials and ebooks, 
Okay, millennial and ebooks is this green category, which is 0.068. You see 0.068 is my numerator divided by the probability that they read more ebooks to get my answer. Okay, so we talk about it here, but this is the multiplication rule for independent events. So when events A and B are independent, the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of A, right? If, they're, if they are independent, knowing A does not change B. They are the same, right? The probability of B given A is equal to the probability of B because knowing A doesn't change anything because they're independent. So we can have a specific case of the general multiplication rule as follows. Probability of A and B is equal to just probability of A times B because we know B doesn't change given A, so it's just probability of B. So if and only if the events are, sorry, that's not true. If the events are independent, then the probability of A and B is probability of A times B. They have to be independent. It does not go both ways. You cannot find that the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times B. That does not mean that they're independent. If they are independent, this rule applies. Okay, this only goes one way. If they're independent, then this rule applies. The probability of A and B both occurring is equal to the probability of A times probability of B. Okay. It only for independent events. It does not prove something's independent. You cannot use this to prove it's independent. It just tells you if they're independent. Right. So here's an example for independent events. Many people who visit clinics to be tested for HIV, the virus that causes AIDS doesn't don't come back to learn their test results. Clinics now use a rapid HIV test that give a result while the client waits. In a clinic in Malwe, for example, use of rapid tests increased the percentage of clients who learned their test results from 69% to 99%. The trade-off for fast results is that rapid tests are less accurate than slow laboratory tests. Applied to people who have no HIV antibodies, one rapid test has a probability of about 0 0.004 of producing a false positive. That's falsely telling someone that antibodies are present when they aren't. Okay, a false positive is you're not positive, but the test tells you you are. Okay. So that happens 0.004% of the time, or 0 0.004. If a clinic tests 200 randomly selected people who are free of HIV antibodies, what is the probability that at least one of the false positives will occur? And you can assume that the tests are independent for the individuals. So no false positives, the probability that right. I don't love how it sets up. So if we're looking, what's the probability that at least one will occur? Well, it's kind of hard to find that, right? That would be probably of, of one, of at least one is one or two or three or four or five or six or seven or all the way up to 200 right that's at least one thing occurring that's a really that's a lot of probabilities to find so instead when we're trying to find at least one it's easier to find the complement right the probability of not at least one is just the probability of none right that's the only option that occurs when there's a probability of at least one the probability that none occur is the only time it happens so instead of finding the probability that at least one occurs, we're going to find the one minus the complement, and that would give us probably of at least one. So the complement here is no false positives. All right. So um, that would be the probability that all 200 tests are negative. Okay, no false positives. So the probability of one false positive is, um, or sorry, the probability that there is no false positive is 0.996. So I multiply that together times itself 200 times. So I just raise it to the 200 power. That equals 0.4486. And now I'm going to do one minus that. One minus no false positives is the same as at least one false positive. So it's 0.5514. All right. And those are our learning targets for us today. See you next time.